Hi everyone, it's really great to be here with you all uh, at Fire Dev Days virtually this year. Um, last year's Dev Days, I was able to attend and it was really great. It has formed a lot of this work that uh, I'll be presenting today along with my colleague, Robert Carroll. So I'm Allison Heath. Um, I'm the Director of Technology and Innovation at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, um, where I'm part of a research center called the Center for Data-Driven Discovery in Biomedicine. And we run a large scale platform for um, NIH called the Kids First Data Resource Center that's focused on pediatric cancers and structural birth defect research. And I'll let uh, Robert introduce himself as well. Hi everyone, I'm Robert Carroll. I'm a faculty member at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. I work with a lot of big NIH cloud research programs like the All of Us Research Program, um, the NHGRI Anvil, and the NHLBI Biodata Catalyst. So I'll start a little bit about uh, some background on, on our research platforms and what we're doing, and that'll lead into a bit about FIRE and the interest uh, that's been picking up around it and how it can help interoperability. Um, so I've been working in this field for a while now um, and started out at the NCI Genomic Data Commons, where really we started working on data commons as a technical solution to big data problems, you know, tackling things such as bringing compute to data, making data fair, but it turns out a real value of the common space is bringing in multiple people from different backgrounds, different aspects of research into collaborative spaces that allow them to do development analysis and discovery together. And so over time, this has really turned into a discussion of how do we create different data ecosystems or different data biospheres. Um, there's a really great uh, Medium article that really defines the different components that are needed here. And then um, more recently, we've become part of something called the Common Fund Data Ecosystem, which is starting to ask ourselves, how do we connect these different data sets? Um, and how do we allow this to happen? So on the next slide, kind of traditionally, um, you know, in the traditional model, kind of even pre-data commons, often people had research uh, data resources that really focused on specific data types, um, specific diseases, genomics, imaging, clinical, and in a lot of ways, a lot of this data was, was siloed. And until some of the data commons platforms and other ways of connecting things happen, it would be even tough to talk about creating an ecosystem. And so, especially with genomics uh, leading the way of how do we have standards, how do we interoperate, how do we run large scale workflows, really pushing the technology, now there's become a recognition of really looking at the clinical and phenotypic data in a, in a closer way and a closer man manner here. Uh, a lot of times, traditionally, each uh, different you know, platform would have its own kind of clinical data model. You would start looking for common data elements. You would try to understand how do those things um, work together. And over the last year, I think it's really become clear that FIRE in the clinical space has really started to influence the research space. It can enable the interoperability in different data flows into these platforms alongside of other data modalities as well. So, Here's just a, a depiction of where we might go with this uh, future. This is not what exists now, but I think what's exciting about Dev Days is uh, the folks here, it's really how do we build this? How do we build these tools? How do we build these connections and get to a world where we could do things um, like I've highlighted on the next slide around different research use cases. And especially coming from pediatrics um, and other kind of rare diseases that are syndromic in nature that touch on many different aspects uh, such as Down syndrome, as a researcher, I might want to understand, you know, why are congenital heart defects um, more prevalent or less prevalent in certain Down syndrome populations? I can't just go to one place and do that anymore. I really need to be able to go across different resources, be able to query them, find different patient cohorts, understand where that data came from, be able to exchange it into my favorite tool. You know, maybe I'm a genomic researcher and I really want to look at it from a genomic aspect. Maybe I'm an imaging researcher. I really want to look at it from an imaging aspect. What's the right platform for me? And how do I have that data flow into that platform that allows me to do the different kind of uh, uh, data that I want to uh, look at? And how do I explore and understand that? And you know, I think um, FIRE really provides an interesting layer of how do we do this? And we're starting to see um, early um, ways of, of doing these different data flows. And I'll turn it over to Robert who will talk a little bit more about that in detail. Sure. And so this is, those slides before were really complicated and this is a really challenging problem that we're trying to solve. So I've broken it down a little bit more simply, less elegantly than Allison has in her slides. But you see here, there's a big picture data flow um, across your screen, hopefully. The ele things like electronic data re health records, things like participants filling out surveys, or maybe even collecting their own data through Fitbit or through Apple Health Records and providing that into these research studies. And then as well, you often have trained research staff, they may be clinicians, they may be other people trying blood 
or doing physical measurements and actually inputting that information into our systems. So with a lot of the programs then, capturing that data is really important. And then there's a data curation process that has to happen, right? And maybe that's about removing identifiers from the data so that we can make it more available to researchers. There's a, and so there's lots of options and opportunities that happen in that space to make it work with tools and, and to do some of those transformations in the data creation space. And then there's a research data repository. And that's the kind of place where the researchers, those people who will be using the data, can actually reach in and take that data out and work with it. And so that these sort of three phases we'll run through here in a minute, trying to understand and dive in a little bit more about the challenges that we're facing and what we're looking to accomplish. So with this data collection space, right, there's a lot of existing research data sets out there. M many of you may be familiar with things like dbGaP, which is the database of genotypes and phenotypes. And in the research space, most data funded by the NIH needs to have data deposited there. So all the genotyping, all the sequencing that happens these days, that ends up in dbGaP. And with appropriate approvals through your own institutional review boards, you could get access to that data and actually be able to do analysis with it, which is a really neat opportunity for research. Uh, but the problem is a lot of this data is stored as flat files. There's very little documentation. It's hard to tell what's going on. And often that structured data, no, being able to use this in a consistent manner across platforms is really hard. So with electronic health record data, um, as everyone here I'm sure is aware, there's a lot of diverse vendor implementations of FHIR. Um, that may change some with the changing rules with from ONC, but there's actually a lot of challenges there potentially. Um, there's also this direct access like Sync for Science where you might be logging through the portal and there's mediated access, right? Which is where actually a participant might get their data themselves and make that available later. So there's some different barriers and challenges with that as well that just create diversity in the source data. Additionally, the survey and electronic data capture sources as mentioned, things like RedCap um, and other survey tools allow for data to be put in. And so that makes it a little bit challenging to integrate the many different data types. And so that's one area in which data curation comes into play. It's a lot of cycles of quality uh, control and quality assurance. Maybe d data from one source wasn't very good or they forgot a column in a, in a kind of classic format or they don't have the coding right. It looks like they're using an outdated LOINT code or something that has been retired in SNOMED. So there's a lot of work that can happen there. It's also really important to have that review of data at the aggregate level to understand are these data sources really very compatible. The importance, of course, of data provenance, particularly when you have so many data streams across um, so many different data sources, it's really important to be able to follow the path of that data to understand what's happening. Um, with vocabularies being aligned as well, there's often different types of source vocabularies that are used. In a clinical setting, you might have a lot of billing codes of ICD-9 and ICD-10, CM, for instance, which might be different from an even thinking just in clinical space from the UK. If you want to use the UK Biobank, right, they have ICD-10 codes, which might look the same, but they're not, as of course many of you are familiar. And then the idea of releasing data to the public can require some amount of amendment to ensure the privacy of the participants in the studies, right? And, and that's a really critical component of this is how do you organize the data? How can you make it available? How are those participants consented? And in a health setting, oftentimes the participant's consenting for you to use their data to treat them, which means you can have all of it, and you, know, you get the HIPAA consent, for instance, signed, and then you can use it and share it to treat that patient. It can be a little different sometimes because maybe the person consented only for a specific disease use case. So you can only use my data to study diabetes. And that gets a little bit harder to manage, especially when you might have a single operational or research server here that has to hold data that might have different conditions surrounding its use. And that's different from the clinical space and something that um, FHIR by natively doesn't necessarily support very well. And then on the researcher side, um, you have a lot of users who don't have any idea what FHIR looks like, who are used to just getting a flat table. And if they need to be able to say, hey, all I want are blood pressures, right? Transforming that from the source data, from those source complex JSON objects, for instance, all the way down into you know, participant ID, blood pressure, can, can take some real work. And so working to build those tools out to support people. And then also that integration of that externally linked data Imaging is pretty common, I think, in the, in the clinical sphere, of course. Full genomics, though, right, actually isn't as prevalent. A lot of it is used to getting those just reports. And so it's important to be able to link that data and make that data accessible as well. And so also there's, a, there's some real training needs in the research community. Obviously, FHIR is, has a steep learning curve. It's very complex. There's a lot of new people, perhaps, coming in that aren't as used to the clinical systems that don't necessarily think that way. And so some of the decisions don't make sense to them. 
I mean, so how, how do we learn about how to do this? How do you just a model development? How do I represent my data? Right. I'm sure everyone has had some challenge or struggle with that. Um, just trying to figure it out and what makes sense and how is this built? Um, it, there's a lot of really good aspects of fire, but once again, it, where, where do you sit? Do you have the background that makes that really clear? So we're, there's a lot of challenges here for data contributors, curators, and research users. Um, and the data dashboard, and there's a link here that has shows some of the APIs there and the design is a kind of initial research application example. How do I look at the different data sources that might be available? And so all these steps are really important um, to, our, to our process and to what we're trying to build. And so we're excited to engage some with, with the FHIR community and with the database community here. So if you have any questions, happy to talk and engage on them now. So thank you all for your time. Great. Thank you.